Nehemiah chapter 9, and uh, we'll be in chapter 10 a little bit uh, later on in, in uh, the message. <clears throat> we looked at last week in uh, chapter 8, all the building, the physical work had been done. And when you look at chapter 8, when Ezra was brought and he stood at a pulpit, he was raised above the people and he's brought to, to bring the word of God. For many of them, it was the first time they've heard the word of God and they stood in reverence to the word of God and they stood for a long period of time. The Bible says they were there a, good, a quarter part of the day listening to the word of God. Remember, they were sorrowful, and then uh, Ezra reminds them that not to bring sorrow, but also to be joyful uh, in what is taking place in their life. So we look at that, that's a perfect picture of revival. We see a people, a God's chosen people that were busy, and they, they worked together, and they got a job done, but it was at the proclaiming of God's word that we see the brokenness, we see the restoration of their walk, with God, and we continue on in in chapter nine. I, I would say this is the the final piece to revival, to seeing revival. Yes, we need the word of God. Yes, we need to see brokenness. We know in Second Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, they seek in God's face, then we will hear from heaven. That's that what we uh, to often talk about when it comes to revival, and that comes about with the Word of God, by listening to the Word of God, being in the Word of God. But the key that we look at today would be the third ingredient. It would be the ingredient to make this uh, take off. And that's what our theme is for the year. And, and we look at the year, and we've been talking about and, and preaching about and praying, uh, asking you to share prayer requests, asking you to be praying uh, over those prayer requests. But we see that is important to... Uh, the revival that was taking place. You, you read about many revivals. You read about revivals of old. We read about movements of God throughout Scripture. This is one of the greatest revivals that had taken place <clears throat> right here in Nehemiah. So our whole day, it happens to fall out that this morning's Sunday school lesson was about prayer. We're in chapter 9 of Nehemiah, and it's about prayer. It's the longest prayer recorded uh, here in Scripture is in Nehemiah chapter 9. And then tonight when we're looking at uh, the sins, the respectable sins, and how it impacts our life, where again, you talk at prayer, our power with God. So if we know that um, it is a key to revival, we've been praying for years to see God move in, in a way that only God could get the honor and glory. That, that would be revival then we ought to take heed to what Nehemiah has for us and the life of the church in our individual lives, uh, and that is prayer. Understand that, that nothing else that we can do will work. He said if we, his people will humble themselves, seek his face and pray, then we'll hear from God. So the question this morning is, how is your prayer life? Question me is, how is my prayer life? It's been said uh, times past, it was said by our uh, president of our college, you know, prayer is one of the things that we talk about the most and practice at least. And it's one of the humbling things if we were to talk uh, about that we, we don't like to talk about it. We don't like to get in fellowship around the table and ask that question. How many of us sit around and say, hey, how is your prayer life today? That's not a topic that come, comes up. Why? We don't like to talk about it. Because when we do, we all, include myself, we all feel uh, that we haven't done enough or our part. So we ask that question, how is our prayer life? How are we doing in regards of prayer? Chuck Sundahl wrote uh, of another guy, and he, he just on that same fact said, talked about prayerlessness. He said, if you wish to humble anyone, he says, I should question him about his prayers. I know nothing to compare to this topic for its sorrowful self-confession. Isn't it true? It's hum humbling. If, if someone were to just point, if you pass the microphone this morning, go around and say, hey, how, 
How was your prayer this morning? How, how long did you pray this morning? Or if you were to turn the tables, it's humbling, that question. It's a self-reflecting question we need to ask. Somebody said, a man is what he is on his knees and nothing more. A, a person is what he is on his knees and nothing else. Speaking of the Christians, uh, of course. So if we want to see God move in, in a supernatural way, we want to see the hand of God, let's take pointers from Nehemiah chapter 9. We'll just start off and just get the context and then we'll go through the chapter. We don't have time to go through the, the whole chapter. And it kind of parallels the, the meat of it from 6 to uh, into 30. Uh, deals with uh, almost the same thing we looked at on Wednesday in 1 Corinthians as a reflection back on what God has done in the past. So let's get the beginning verses here, the first, uh, first three verses. It says, Now on the 20th and fourth day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting and with sackcloth and earth upon them. And the seed of Israel separated themselves from all strangers and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. And they stood up in their place and read the book of the law of the Lord their God, one fourth part of the day, and another fourth part of the day confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. That's what he says is they read the, the book of the law, that's the word of God, and the other part of the day they confessed uh, the, their sins. They prayed to God and worshiped God through prayer. So the, it's true that it humbles everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher, a pastor, a missionary, a Sunday school teacher, a janitor, or just somebody that uh, comes to church and checks in and checks out. Prayer is a leveler. When we talk about prayer, it levels us and gets us in perspective. That is, uh, I think Tom called it, it's the artillery, artillery, artillery of the Christian warfare. It is our power source. You know, we said before, what good is, is it to have a, a power gun or a power tool that plugs in and have no power? Nowadays, there's, we don't plug anything in, but it's like having that, that lithium drill or impact gun without the battery. What good is it? You know, we sold a couple of those tools at the yard sale. People had old Makita drills and, and things, but with no battery. It, it, it was no good to any of us that didn't have the battery or didn't want to spend $100 to buy a battery. But somebody that had the battery, it was valuable. And that's what a Christian life is to God. It's valuable if we're plugged into the power source. It's valuable if we're plugged into what God is doing. So we've got to, one, want it. One, we've got to want to see God move in a real way. We have desire to to meet with God, be in God's presence, to hear from God. If we want revival in our own life. See, we, we talk about the country and we talk about the world we live in. We've got to narrow this down and, and look at rebuilding our walk with God. Our life, our own life, our own homes, and our own church. And, and we start here and, and what God could do in our life. And it's like every, anything else that is worthwhile, you got to ask your question, are you willing to pay the price? If you want something, if you want to see something uh, 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 done, we got to ask, are we willing to pay the price? Are we willing to do what God wants us to do? We see some principles here that we'll get out of this uh, text and know that God will answer our prayers. If we're following these things and we see God move in our life, I believe God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We can look through Scripture and see how God led Nehemiah. We see how God provided for Nehemiah. We see how God restored and protected them against the enemy attacks. And we see this revival break out. Well, God's not a respecter of persons. He's just not going to do it back then and then say today, well, you're on your own. So the first thing we want to look at is, as first thing is called repentance. First thing is repentance. Remember, in, in, last week in chapter 8, when they started reading the Word of God, they were broken. They were broken about their sin. They were broken in the fact that they had broken fellowship with God. 
They had been wandering around. They had been doing their own thing. And, and they were reminded about being joyous. And he said, Don't, no longer weep. And they reminded them about joy. But we open up in chapter 9 and they go back. They were assembled together with fasting and with sackcloths and the earth upon them. We see in scripture other times uh, when people are broken and they cry out to God. That, that picture of putting on sackcloth and ashes and falling before God is it's a symbol of brokenness. It, it's a symbol of complete dependence upon God. You just lay in prostate in front of God and say, I can't, but you can. And here back at chapter 9, the children of Israel back to that point. Now they've listened to the word of God for three to four hours already. Now it says that they spent the next three or four hours worshiping God in prayer. See, these go hand in hand. We spent a year talking about the importance of the word of God. And now we're talking about the importance of prayer. They, they're like a hand and a glove. They work together in get, gaining access and the power of God. They were broken about their sin. They were celebrating the, the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles. And last week I told you they were inside the wall and they were supposed to gather together sticks and, and build to them some huts to go live in these, these hunts, huts, these tents out there. But they were not following the word of God completely. They were worshiping, remembering the Feast of Booths, but they weren't doing the building of the huts, and they get back to all that. So we see that they listened to God. They wept, they mourned, they fasted, they put on sackcloth and ashes because of their sins and the sins of their forefathers. Are you surprised? Uh, and think, think logically about it. Would, would you be surprised that that would be their reaction? I, I think that would be a natural reaction. It, actually, when we look at our life and we really get a glimpse of God, or when we step out of this earth into eternity, we think, oh, we're going to be dancing the streets of gold. No, we're going to be laying on our face before a holy God and, and really understand all that God has, has done for us. So we should get a glimpse of that now uh, in our walk with the, the Lord. So we see that they wept before the Lord. We see that they were broken about what had taken place. They were humbled at the fact that God continued to, to work in their life. That parallels the Christian life. If I'm just speaking of myself, then I'm speaking of myself, but uh, many times uh, it parallels the Christian life. You know, just look over the last year. We, we focused on prayer the whole beginning of the year and, and being passionate about prayer and praying and, and seeking God to do something. But now we're in August. It's August already. Ask yourself, just personally reflect and say, am I as passionate about my prayer life now as when we were focused on it? See, it's not just us. It's not just me because when we studied 1 Corinthians, that was Paul was telling them is, hey, we got into comfort mode. And, and when we get into that mode, we're neglecting the things of God and things were happening in the church of Corinth that didn't need to be there. And he had them reflect over what had taken place. We have a wonderful privilege to have fellowship with the Lord, to commune with the Lord, to to get together with him and, and have that uh, power to have God move in our way. Where we can see God move in our life and we can say as that song, you know, we're going to stand in heaven. It's not I, but what Christ has done. He's forgiven me of my sins. It wasn't anything I did. But how about here today? What about in our Christian walk? Can we say that? Say, you know what? It wasn't a me. It's what God has done through me. I was just a vessel allowing God to work in and through my life. So many times we forget. We forget the wonderful benefits we have of being one of God's children, the wonderful access we have to the throne room of God. Great deal of churches, probably because of the affluence that we have today, Neglect this part of crying out to God. God we receive God's blessings. We, we live in a very affluent time. 
uh, compared our country and where we live to, to the rest of the world. And I think sometimes we get this mindset in our Christian walk that that's how it ought to be. It ought, ought to always be uh, this way. It ought, ought always be easy. But you know what? Things happen in our life. God gets our attention, causes us to repent, confess our sins, and, and move. Think about your conversion. Think about the time where you've trusted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. The one thing you had to do to become a Christian is repent. You had to turn from your way of thinking. I, I was okay. See, I grew up, I went to church. And, and I went to church and, and we worshiped. And I thought I was okay, but what I had to repent of was my false belief because what Christ has done, He wanted to have a personal relationship with me and not set up, establish a religion. So I had to repent of my religious walk and trust Him as my personal Lord and Savior and have a personal walk with Him. He said, follow me. Jesus said, follow me and take up your cross. Deny yourself, He's saying. See, some, some say, well, I trusted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior 25 years ago. And, I asked, and He forgave me of all my sins. So I don't confess, I don't repent of any of my sins anymore. When Jesus said, follow me, take up your cross, that's denying yourself. We, we need to daily, I, I mean, it, many times in the day, confessing our sins because we've uh, neglected or did something that we shouldn't have done, or neglected to do something we should have, we need to repeat that in our life. We need to de deny ourselves, and we need to confess our sins. If we don't humble ourselves before God, if we don't keep short accounts with God, as Psalm 66, verse 18 says, we hide iniquity, regard iniquity in our heart, then he, I will not hear you, hear you. Our prayers are affected by what we have in our life. I was thinking about this. You know, the fire whistle goes off, or you see cops go down, flying down the street and all those, and all the first responders that are out there doing their job. They do their job, and they get a call, and they respond. But imagine they get a call, and it's somebody they know. You think they respond differently? I know they respond differently. I, and, and imagine if it's not only somebody to know, but it's somebody related to them. They respond differently. Years ago when I rode with the police department, and uh, I don't remember who did it, and probably it's a good thing, but uh, one of the kids at, dialed 911. And it was just a normal day, and everything, all of a sudden this cop come running up the sidewalk, everything all right? I said, yeah, everything's fine. Oh, well, we got a 911 call at Hang Up. And it was one of the guys that I spent a lot of time riding with. He said, I, I knew it was your house. And I came running. And, and got to thinking, you know, that, that relationship makes a difference. Because also know firefighters that the alarm goes off and they're like, it's not my house. And they go back to sleep. Because <laughs> you know, we volunteer. But if it was our house, guess what? They're going to get up and do something about it. So you get that picture of that relationship. Well, we could be you know, walking with God. We could be one of God's children, but be, have all this clutter be, between us. You know what it is like with your children. You know what it's like with somebody and, and, and the relationship's bro broken or there's a lot of uh, distance in that relationship and then they come to you and ask you for something. What are you talking about? <laughs> you want to borrow $1,000? Yeah, and been nice for the last uh, 10 years, <laughs> you know. You, but that's what it, God, here it is. We're saying that we trust Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He loves us, and, and we have this access to Him. So we've got to understand, we've got to look back what God has done for us, remember, and we need to turn. So when God speaks to our heart, what do we do with it? Right here, we respond like the children of Israel. When God speaks to our hearts, either through the Word of God, reading God's Word, the preaching of God's Word, even in singing. We've been in church service, and the song service was going on, and this was years ago in Jacksonville, and they started singing. We were in a song service, and all of a sudden the altar's flooded. 
and, and hundreds of people were weeping and crying. And it was a Sunday night in, in Jacksonville. I remember the song, remember it, and I remember the pastor. Did, he had a sermon he had prepared. He was ready to preach. You know what he didn't do? He didn't preach that night. The Spirit of God moved and people that hadn't talked to each other in 10 years went and asked forgiveness and got right with, with the Lord and, and made things right so the power of God could fall upon their lives. See, when we become hard-hearted, we become cold spiritually. Guess what affects our prayer life? It affects our prayer life. We become indifferent to the, the Bible. We don't pray. You know, it's hard enough when, when we are pursuing God. It's hard enough for us that, that say, you know what, I'm going to make a conscious effort. I'm going to spend my time with God. Imagine people that, that aren't gathered together worship and aren't uh, pursuing those things. It, it's got to be near to almost impossible So our prayer life suffers. It's a vicious cir circle. If we don't allow the Word of God, the seed to be planted, the soil becomes hard. And the soil becomes hard, it's hard to plant that seed. What does the far farmer have to do? He has to go and plow up that hollow ground. That's what the Spirit of God does in our life. Aren't you grateful for the Spirit of God? The chastening hand of God that reminds us, hey, I want to have a closer relationship with you. I want you to be doing this and that. And when he breaks up that ground, our response is what is important. We've got to repent. We've got to turn from our ways, our way of neglecting prayer, our way of doing our own thing. So the question is, do we need to repent? I think everyone, including myself, we, we do. Probably right now for something we've done this morning or didn't do this morning, just getting ready to get to church. So remember the farmer plowing up the ground, and that's what the Word of God did. They, these people, they were, they were workers. And Nehemiah got them together, and they labored, and they worked hard. But it was when the Word of God was brought forth. We saw they were broken. They were concerned about what they had not done. The, the fellowship that was broken between them and God. That was that, that ground that was broken up. Hosea says, Sow to yourself in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord and His righteousness upon us. That's what we all do. That'll be our prayer. Is Lord, break up the fallow ground. And, and when the Lord does, don't... Don't just pray it. Don't just ask the God to search our heart and see if there's anything in there. But we've got to respond. And the response is, is repentance, turning. That we see that outward of, of the children of Israel here, the way they responded. The second thing is reflection. They reflected on what God had done. And that's a point that parallels with uh, what Paul told them in 1 Corinthians. He went through a whole big section there of, of what God had done for the children of Israel and how God protected and led them and, and all that had taken place. We won't take time to read all of it, but look at verse 6. And, and, and you can go back and read from 6 to 15 and, and circle the word and uh, in the Bible in this passage. It says, Thou, even thou art Lord alone. Thou hast made heavens the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all things that are therein, the seas and all that is therein, and thou perver, perver, uh, preservest them all, and the host of heaven worship thee. Thou art the Lord, the God who did choose Abraham and brought him out forth of Ur of Chaldees and gavest him the name Abraham." So you go on and he says, and Lord, you did this and this, verse 15, and gave us them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought us forth water to them out of the rock for their thirst and promised them that they should go into the possess the land which thou had a sworn to give them. Here he is reflecting over all the things that God had done. God had continued pour out, poured out His blessings upon them. He continued over and over to see what God had done. We sing a song, 
And we sing it in November. Count your blessings, name them one by one. See all the things the Lord has done. You know what will get you through the trying times? You know what will get you through the times is, is reflecting on what God has done. Look at the blessings that God has blessed you with. Just the fact that we have the Word of God. The fact that somebody cared enough to share God's love to you. The fact that you responded to, to His call for salvation. All these things we can be thankful. Count the blessings and it will surprise you all that God has done. When was the last time you went and just reflected? I know in Thanksgiving, I know in November we make the list of things that we're thankful for. But maybe we ought to do that more often as, as just write down, just look at all the things that God has blessed us with. So he uses the word and, goes throughout all this passage and talks about all that God had done for them. Now look, drop down to verse 16. He changes. He says, but they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearken not to thy commandments. The word but, they take a reflection and their reflection takes a change here. They're saying, look, God has been good. God has supplied us. God has done all these things. God has provided us food in the wilderness. God's hand was upon our life. Then you get to verse 16. But our fathers had forsaken. But we have hardened our neck. But we have become proud. Does that sound familiar? Have we seen that in Christianity over the years? Have we seen it maybe in our own lives over the years? All, all that God has done and reflect over those things. How important is the Word of God? That's how it's important that we not neglect and, and we not lose sight that it's not I. It's not anything that we have done, not what we're doing. It's God and what God has blessed us with. If it's ability to go to work and what we have, it, it's God, not government. God that enabled us to do these things. Drop down to verse 26. So regardless of their stubbornness before God and how unyielding they were, they become proud. In verse 26, he says, Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against thee and cast thy law behind their backs and slew the prophets which testified against them and turned them to thee and they walk great provocations therefore thou deliverest them into the hand of their enemies who vexed them they had stiffened their necks they had begun to rebel they had rebelled and god continued to bless them and god continued to protect them they had neglected god and god continued to bless god continued to protect them they continued to rebel and this cycle goes over and over and we see that they turn back to god they didn't learn their lesson, and they go back and forth. That just shows how unfaithful we are. But aren't you glad we serve a faithful God? God was there, and God took care of them. God met their needs. God protected them. One thing that boggles the mind is the long-suffering of God. I mean, if, if we were God... I mean, just how we deal with our, our, our children, and some of us are more patient than others, and, and I've heard it said before, I'm glad that you're not God, <laughs> because there's very little grace at times. God doesn't get irritable. God doesn't get tired. God long-suffering. So to understand that we can continue on, but yet God is long-suffering, and, and He holds back His wrath for a period of time and allows us an opportunity to repent, to get back on track. We're the same as the children of Israel. We, at times, we turn our back. We, we spawn the goodness of God. We, we just overlook. We live in a time of affluence. Imagine being in an area. Imagine being somewhere where we didn't have the things we had, where we had to call out to God and, and really understood that it was God that provided our meal today. It was God's hand. I mean, the children of Israel, if it wasn't for God, they would have starved to death. There was no way there was enough fish to feed the army right there at that spot. It was a, enough meal for that time for, to sustain them for their journey. But God took care of their every need. 
and saw them along the way. So has God's people ever ch really changed? Yeah, I mean, we're talking about Nehemiah. We're talking the Old Testament here. When was the last time that we sat back and reflected on God's grace in our life? Years ago, David Jeremiah wrote a book just on grace. And, and we read it, and, and it was a great reminder. Even, even Sunday to the school this morning and reminding about our salvation and all that God has given us, uh, it's good to reflect on the goodness of God. And, and that book came out, and it was written, and it was all about God's grace, and it was a great reminder. But there were some Christians say, why do you got to read that? We, we already know that we have God's, God's grace because it's a great reminder of what we have and helps us to worship Him uh, rightly and helps us in our prayer life. God has given us so many opportunities. God has given us more than second chances, thousands of chances. Even, I go back to my salvation. Remember, I, I was religious, and, and sometimes that's, that's the hard ones. Religious or well-off are the hard ones to, to share the gospel with. But to go back and see that God gave me opportunities. We were just talking this week. I said, you know what? I missed an opportunity back. We were just out of high school. Billy Graham came to, to Philadelphia, and the church was taking a trip to, to Philadelphia to see Billy Graham. And I talked myself out of, out of going. But you know what? God gave another opportunity. Continue to give opportunities and open, open doors. So just in the fact of salvation, how God continued to knock on our door. Well, He does it today in, in our life. The, the fact that, uh, you know, we didn't plan it, to, that today was all about prayer. It's just the way Sunday school happened and where we are in Nehemiah chapter 9. Why? It's a great reminder for us in August, the, the theme that we started on, the, the realization that we needed this in our life, in our Christian life, in, in our church, in our homes, we needed this. God gives us His goodness over and over and over again. So the question is, do we ever take time to reflect on the goodness of God? I challenge you, take, take some time in the upcoming week. Don't wait till November. Take some time this upcoming week and, and just count your blessings of God in your life. Look at verse 3 again. Chapter 9, back. This is what they did. Listen, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord their God one fourth part of the day. Another fourth part they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. They took time. Remember I said, if anything's worth it, it's going to take effort. It's going to take an investment. It's going to take a conscious decision. It took time for them to get to know God. They didn't just open the book Ezra, okay, read us a paragraph. Ezra, read us a, a, a chapter. Ezra, give us a verse for the day. No, it says they stood there for hours listening to the Word of God. Then they responded by worshiping and praying and, uh, before the Lord. They spent some time getting to know God, making up for lost time if to say. Remember Nehemiah? If we look at the life of Nehemiah and we learn from Nehemiah, did he get a burden for the wall? Did he get a burden for, for what God's planned for him to do? The job, the task to go rebuild the walls? Did he get that burden and then take off the next day and do it? No. Nehemiah spent months praying and fasting before he even went to the king. And then when the king saw his countenance, then he went to the king. Then he goes back to uh, Israel, he goes back and he looks at the city himself and he goes out at night. He doesn't proclaim what he's doing. He doesn't advertise and put out bulletins on doorposts. He goes and he prays and he seeks God and God opens the door and everything walked to work together. And in 50 plus days, they, they get the wall done because God did it. 
Because Nehemiah learned to listen to God and depended upon God. When opposition came to Nehemiah and the children of Israel in the work that was being done, they didn't just have their knee-jerk reaction. I mean, I shared a funny story when we were in Port Charlotte after the hurricane and that sent groups of guys out to do different tasks and different work jobs. And we sent a group out uh, to do a, some tarping of roofs. And we have a group of Christian brothers tarping this roof and there's this fight breaks out. One of our guys takes a hammer to a gunfight and goes down there and breaks up the fight. And he's like, what were you thinking? Well, he was just thinking he's going to go there and stop this. One of our guys was a highway patrol officer. He stayed back and said, hey, this might not be the smartest thing to get to, to go down there. What he was saying is we don't just act all the time. We need to wait for the movement of God. So what Nehemiah is teaching us throughout the book, above anything else about the life of Nehemiah, is this, that Nehemiah was a man of prayer. And we see not only Nehemiah in chapter 1 up to this point was a man of prayer, now we see the children of Israel responding to the Word of God in prayer, following the lead that Nehemiah set. So people had gotten on their knees, fallen on their face before God. They took some time out. We were just talking about this the, this morning, just five minutes before, uh, before the sermon, before we began to worship the Lord. Is a practice that is in Scripture that we probably don't practice very much. And I'm as guilty as the rest of them, and that is a thing called fasting. And what all fasting is, is taking time to show God He's more important God, you're more important than this meal I'm about to eat. You're more important than this activity that we take some time out and we invest in our walk with the Lord. I've heard it said, you know, that fasting from food and nowadays it, 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 it's people have fasted from their social media. I, I know young people have gone to camp and they've been challenged at camp and they come back and they turn off all their social media for a month. Could you imagine all the free time that freed up? It's some time to spend, spend with God and showing that, God, you're important. That's what fasting is, and, and that's what these people took the time out of their day, a, a good half of their day, to focus on the Lord. Go over the story of your life. Look at the spiritual milestones that God has done. See in the hand of God how God has provided over the years and worship Him uh, on those, pray about those things. So we have repentance, we have reflection. Go with me to verse 33, chapter 9. So they begin to see the picture. They said our fathers, and they prayed about their fathers. Verse 33, How be it, thou art just in all that thou hast brought upon us. For thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. So they look at their time in, in uh, a time of bondage, in their time that they have been away, and they said, you know what? God, you were right. You were just in what you have done. You know, we don't like the chasing the hand of God. But they recognized, they were recognizing what God had did in their life was for their benefit. Verse 38, And because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our uh, princes, Levites, and priests seal it unto you. They said, Lord, we've been guilty. They acknowledge what they have done, how they neglected God. Their forefathers had neglected God. You know, that's a big step of taking ownership. But you know what we like to do? We like to argue. We know, we know we're wrong, but we like to argue. Stand our ground. I wonder how many of us argue with God. God's trying to get our attention. God's trying to show us something. God's trying to show us how blessed we are and the mission that He has for us. And we've neglected that. We've neglected the blessings. Just the privilege of praying. 
it's a side note, but that was one of the things that was taught to me before I got saved that, that really got my antennas uh, alert to the things of God and what God has done for us. Because, see, growing up in religion, we had to go to a priest and we had to confess our sins and, and tell the priest our sins and then he'd tell us what we had to do. But we have don't, don't have to go to somebody. We have a great high priest. The veil is torn. We get to go to the Holy of Holies. We get to go to God ourselves and confess our sins, and He forgives us our sins. We go directly to Him in our prayer closet. God wants nothing between us. Imagine seeing Him face to face. If God were to come back right now, if God to come back this afternoon, would there be something that we would not want to look into His face, that we'd be ashamed of and we'd say, you know what, I, I didn't. Do what you've told me to do. I didn't surrender everything to you. So the price has to be paid. We have to be open about our sin. We've got to be honest about our sin. We've got to confess our sin, repent of our sin. That sin could be what's hindering your life. That God wants to uncover and God wants to pour out His blessing. God wants to, to move in a supernatural way. As talked about this morning, God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And, and we've got these sins in our life. And, and we've got the sins of omission. Things that we've omitted out. Things that we're not doing that we should be doing. And then things of commission. Things that we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. And one of the things that we're omitting is praying. If we're not praying, then we're not witnessing. And so these omitted sins make an impact on the world around us. And then the sins of commission, we fill in that time that we should be doing with the Lord. Think about the effect of unforgiveness has in our life. If we're unable to forgive, God has forgiven us all our sins, but if we're unable to forgive a brother or sister and we harbor that in us, how what effect are we to God? If we're holding on to another sin, if we're holding on to greed, we're holding on... We, we just went through, I don't know how many chapters in that book, the respectable sins. There, there's at least 15 chapters in that book, a number of sins, greed and worldliness and loss, all the things that you can imagine... In there, If any one of those things in our life that we're harboring, we're affecting our usefulness for God. <clears throat> one person, he, he exhorted his people to take out pen and paper and make two columns of sins. Sins of omission, the things that you ought to do that you have not done. So those would be things like praying. Those would be th things like witnessing. Those are things like uh, tithing, things like attending worship, things that we have not done. Then on the other column, put sins of commission, things you have done that you shouldn't have done. And when, and when he said he had his congregation write those two lists, they realized their guilt before God. They confessed that, that, that guilt. They confessed that and then repented of it. So what, what are you saying? We, you know, we learned to pray. Father, forgive us of my sin. Lord, if I, if I sin today, forgive me of my sins. No, what they did here was they named it and claimed it. They said, we, we were wrong and Lord, you were right. It's not a blanket prayer. When we go to prayer and pray before God, we need to name those things. That's what that, that pastor told his congregation. Write these things down. I bet you it would amaze us when we sat down and write down the things, the sins that we omit, omission sins or commission sins, and we, we write those down. Well, we reveal them, we got to repent of them, confess them, agree with God with them. That's what they did here. They agreed, God, you were right. You were righteous. And, and understand, like Joseph said, Lord, <laughs> they, they meant it for evil, but you meant it for good. And God uses these times in our life, and he uses them for good. It's just being obedient to God, what God wants us to do in 
our lives. Look with me to chapter 10. We're not going to go through the whole chapter, but verse 29 and 30. Look at the effect it had on the children of Israel. Verse 29, they claved to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a uh, curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. Verse 30, and that we would not give our daughters unto the people of the land, nor take their daughters for our sons. <clears throat> what happened was they, ref- they reflected, they recognized their sin, and then it turned them to restoration. The last thing here is they restored what? They restored their relationship with God. They said, you know what? We're not now going to co-mingle. We're, we're not going to give our, our daughters to the heathen. We're not going to take heathens uh, for our daughters' husbands. They said they're, they're going to willing to pay the price, to stand apart for the Lord. What was it? It was found in their home life. They refused and did what was right in their home with their children. Tom talked about it this morning in his message. He talked about their time, their time in the morning with, with God's Word. It's called family altar. Time that we, we can sit down with our kids and teach them the Word of God, pray together, pr- talk about the missionaries and what God's doing in the missionaries around the world. And it's not just when we have kids at home. Everybody can spend time together. Revival starts in our heart. It's going to start in our home. And it's going to bring discipline back into our life, in our homes. And then it's going to overflow into the church. It affects their social life. We see that they weren't going to give their, their kids over. It says that they, they said that we're not going to give our daughters over. What did they do? They restored God's order. God had told them and they just went about doing their own own thing and they went back to restoring order starting in the home there was revival in their responsibility their own response they took responsibility of their self and that's what it is in in our life we got to take responsibility we've got to take ownership of where we are one was they were guilty in their given. They weren't given back to the Lord. They weren't given to the Lord. Remember, Haggai talks about that they were living in their houses. Their houses were uh, complete, but the house of God laid waste, and that the God rose up the prophet and you know, yanked their chain. They were neglecting their faithfulness to give to God, their faithfulness in worship to worshiping God. Our worship isn't going to enrich God. It doesn't make God any better. God is God. He doesn't change at all. But it changes our attitude and how we respond to God. The Bible says, where does man rob God? Man robs God in his tithes and offerings, and which is our reasonable service, our reasonable worshiping to God. So our worshiping, to God, not just in our giving, but also in our worship, coming together and worshiping Him. They recognized their, their sin. They neglected God's house and God's people. Now they got their, their life right individually. Now they're getting the, the church back on track. Back in chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, we read 6 earlier and started the reflection of what God has done. But verse 5 talks about all the people that got together and he said, they stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever and blessed be the glorious name which is exalted above all blessings and praise. When Ezra got up and read, he had a group of seven people on this side, a group of six people over here and and the people responded and they responded and say, hey, we got to bless the Lord. Verses 6 through 31 deals with all the blessings that God had done. They reflected over the past and what God had done for them. Verses 32 uh, to 37 
They looked into themselves in, in the present situation and asked God to help them, to restore them to where they needed to be and where we need to be. So we look at Nehemiah and the, the longest prayer here, and it's a time of revival in the children of Israel's life. They had started with the preaching of the Word of God, their response to the Word of God. They break up into prayer. It takes repentance, reflection on what God's blessing, how God has blessed you, recognize our sins, recognize God's hand in our life, and then restore, get back to where we need to be. We confess our sins. We confess where we've fallen short. We confess the things we neglected to do. Now we get back where we need to be.